And for a few minutes, if you will, turn in the Bible to Acts chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11 on page 1164 in the old Scofield Bible. Acts chapter number 11 and verse number 19. The Bible says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen uh, traveled as far as Phoenix, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them uh, were men of Cyprus and Serene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. When, uh, who, when he came uh, had, and, and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Cleaving unto the Lord. That's something that everybody should be practicing right now, getting used to, living every day. It's a good word, and I'll mention something about it. But right here in verse number 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now the news is out. There is a real moving of God in these places where these persecuted Jews had been scattered and they're preaching and they go to preach to those uh, other Jews and uh, but boy other people begin to hear the good news about Jesus Christ and even Gentiles got interested in what was going on. I want to tell you something. You preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll be surprised who will be attracted to that. Because there's some people may uh, act like they're, you know, uh, atheistic, but you get on to them with the gospel of Christ and just keep on preaching the gospel of Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit of God fill you and bless you and lead you and guide you. Brother, some of those people will knuckle under sooner or later and they'll get saved. You and I know, that, uh, know how it feels to be like that. So right here, uh, the news is out and it's, of course, spreading like wildfire, not only to the Gentiles, but back to the home church in Jerusalem. They're hearing about it in Jerusalem now. And it seems right here that the home church didn't really recognize at this particular time what was happening because you know that they have been told to spread the gospel around the world, to preach the gospel to every creature and to spread the good news of Jesus everywhere. But they had probably forgotten about that commission and had let it just kind of die down. And they were not really fired up about it until they heard this going on. And they said, listen, there's something going on over there at Antioch and Cyprus and Serene. We need to send somebody over there and check this out. We want to make sure that it's the real thing. And so they sent Barnabas over there to check this situation out. And Barnabas was a, 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 a Jew, a separate Jew, and uh, not a Palestinian Jew, so that would make it uh, easier for him to communicate with them. And so uh, we have in verse 23, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad. Now what a true Christian this was. What a character this man had. Barnabas, he's next to Paul the apostle. He's a great man of God. He could have said, well, yeah, they're having a hoopla over there. They're just shouting the house down and carrying on and, and emotion is just taking over the church over there and uh, nothing much to it. It'll probably burn out in a little while. But no, Barnabas, when he saw that it was really God blessing and people were rejoicing, people were getting saved and Christians were being revived and they were shouting and praising the Lord and rejoicing in the things of God, he saw that it was the real grace of God that was operative in that church. Now let me say this, brother and sister, we have had people down through the years criticize us and they have said, and I've heard it said that truth missionary, they just make a lot of noise. There's nothing really deep about it. It'll just be, it'll fizzle out. Well, 46 years is being in fizzling. 
Yes, sir. 46 years of fizzling, and brother, it hasn't fizzled yet. And I'll tell you why, praise God, because we know that we are in the Spirit of God when we let go and, and praise God. I don't know why in the world you'd want to go to church and sit in church all the time and listen to a deadhead preacher try to put down everything that's glorious and good. I want the glory. I want the joy. I want to be able to rejoice. I don't want to come to a dead church. Brother Thomas was talking about in the prayer room. He and his wife coming to church tonight were talking about how good it is to have friends to come and to fellowship with. And I had been thinking about that today myself, how wonderful it is to come to the house of God, meet each other, go in the prayer room or wherever and fellowship one with another. Hey, this is the real thing. Brother, we're here to honor and glorify that name that is above every name, uh, the name of Jesus. We're here to be er honest and earnest in our heart toward the things of the Lord. And so my friend Barnabas saw what God's grace had done was doing, and it rejoiced his heart. He was not jealous. He was not jealous at all, but he was delighted in what he saw uh, going on from these people that were preaching the precious gospel. Now, Barnabas saw the obvious deliverance of people that were being saved. When you see somebody get saved, how can you deny that God is there? In other words, whenever you take an old rotten sinner, hell bound, hell bent, mean as a rattlesnake, and then he comes to Jesus and he's changed all of a sudden, you're going to deny that God met that guy? Brother, listen, I want to tell you, I wish I could show you a picture of before and after in my personal life. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. There are things that I think about now, and I say, I can't believe I ever did that. I can't believe I ever went there. I can't believe it. After all these years of living for the Lord, it seems almost like that didn't really happen, but it did. But that's what the grace of God does for us. It changes us all the way through and through. Praise his holy name. Nobody else can. I'll tell you, a church can't. No organization can't. But Jesus can. He can change you. Praise the Lord. And so Barnabas saw this deliverance, that it was obvious that they were really getting saved and that it was spreading and it was powerful. And then we see not only uh, this obvious deliverance, but an ostensible danger in verse number 23. The Bible says, and he exhorted or warned them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now Barnabas was not a wet blanket. No, sir. There are plenty of wet blankets in most churches today, but he was not that. He was not critical of the joy and the gladness of these that were professing the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> he was glad. Excuse me. He was glad to see these people getting saved and being happy about it. Now, I know what everybody is afraid of <coughs> when you get emotional. You're afraid something's going to get in there that ought not be. And so that's what the Jerusalem church was concerned about and what Barnabas was really concerned about. He was wise enough to see that in this kind of excitement, somebody may join right in with their emotions, but not with their heart, not with their heart purpose, not giving their heart to Jesus Christ. I've had people to come to this church in years gone by, and I've had people to, when you're on a good service, I mean, when everybody's shouting and crying and going to the altar and, and they're blowing their nose and hugging one another and loving one another, I've had people come here and get in, in, emo, in the emotion, and kind of get lifted up, and you'd think, boy, they're on fire. They're going to really make good church members. Never see them again. After they got out, it just died because it wasn't from the heart. Hey, don't ever shout if it's not from the heart. Don't ever praise God if you don't believe it and don't mean it from your heart. It's got to be from the heart, hallelujah, but when it's from the heart, it'll last. It'll go on and on and on. Hey, glory. Praise his holy name. He warned them that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. Now, the word purpose right here is prosthesis, which means to set forth or to place before or to exhibit. Now, they were to, they were to purpose in their heart to follow Jesus all the way, all, all the day. Every day, 
Sunday from Sunday to Sunday, every single day, Monday, hallelujah, yeah, Blue Monday. That's not what a Christian sings about because Christians don't have Blue Mondays any more than they have a Blue Sunday. We get blue sometimes, but it's not the day that does it. It's the experiences we go through. Boy, I'll tell you right now, you're going to experience some things that'll knock you flat, get you down, discourage you so much you don't know whether, and I was talking to Brother Neil a while ago about this very same thing. We can get down. We can get discouraged. We can run into troubles. And brother, it's awful. You wonder how you're going to make it. Somehow or another, God's grace is sufficient and it stays right there. Brings you through. Hey, the grace of God is greater than anything. You can't beat the grace of God. So Barnabas saw God's grace at work right here. And we see his onward duty in verse 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Now Barnabas saw this grace of God. He rejoiced over the salvation of these souls. And he made it clear that this work of God was not a passing fancy, but a lifetime commitment of purpose. You and I didn't get saved to just live a little while for the Lord, make a profession and say, well, I've got eternal security and now I'll go on and live my, other, my life the way I was living it before. No, when we got saved, it was forever and forever. And I mean, even though we backslide sometimes, get cold and indifferent, we come back. We keep coming back. We keep fighting it. We get down. We get up. We get down. We get up. It's that way. It's a continual thing. I've never in my lifetime enjoyed anything better in, in serving the Lord. I was telling somebody, even if I quit what I'm doing, I would not quit Jesus. If I quit you, I might be able to quit you. I don't know. I was talking to Brother Underwood a while ago. I love the people. I mean, I get tired physically, and I could retire and say, man, I can go fishing every day. I don't have to go pastor a church, but I love you too much. I want to be with you. I want to be around you, praise God. I love what we have here, brother. This is not a passing fancy, brother. This is what God gave us. Hallelujah. It's real in our soul tonight. Bless his holy name. Glory to God. Real love, real deep love in our heart today. And then, of course, they were to purpose in their hearts to follow Jesus all their days and to exhibit this as Christians ought to. The word cleave means to abide with. And Jesus said uh, that we, if we abide in him and he abides in us, we'll bear fruit. So while we should be excited over the evangelization of the lost and the revival of saved people, we must not let the excitement cause us to miss the truth about salvation. We don't want anybody to come in here during an emotional stir and the Holy Ghost blessing and then somebody just say they got saved because they felt something. We don't want them to say that. We want them, unless they felt conviction, but we don't want them to say I got saved because I felt good. Brother, you won't feel good tomorrow and then what are you going to do? Because you're going to feel bad most of the time. If Satan has anything to do with it, he has a lot to do with it. So you better not base your salvation on feeling. You better base it on faith in the Lord Jesus. And then it's all right to start praising him. Hallelujah. And rejoicing in him. Hallelujah. I love him. So Barnabas saw this work. He saw it. It was really working. He rejoiced over the salvation. He saw that it was really and clearly real. It was not a put on. And his character exemplified that of Jesus Christ. Spoken of in Acts 10, 38, he went about doing good. Jesus went about doing good, and so did Barnabas go about doing good. Uh, then, of course, he was full of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, which means he was totally controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then he was full of faith. Not only full of the Holy Ghost, but full of faith. He trusted Christ for everything, in everything. Are you, am I, trusting Jesus for everything? I'm going to tell you, that's not easy sometimes. 
Sometimes we say, well, I know he could do that. I know he could do that. That's not too difficult. But this, I don't know where he's even interested in talking to me about it or listening to me talk to him about it. I just don't know where Jesus is really going to intervene in that situation. We just have to wait and see. But I'll bet you, I'll guarantee you, just hang in there a while and see God do a miracle for you. Now, I'm not talking about this foolish stuff. Have you had your miracle today? Like some of these people say, I'm talking about a real miracle. Watch God intervene and, and, and overrule in your life things that are just impossible. So Barnabas takes his duty seriously here. He sees that the job is too big for him alone. So he departs to find Saul, verse 25, and he sees how far-reaching this grace of God is and then the potential of it, where it may go how big it may get. You know what could Truth Missionary Baptist Church do more than what we're doing now? There's no telling. Because if there's ever been a church that had potential, this one is. Did you know that if I died and you got another pastor in here, he would probably say, all right, now, folks, we've got a good church right here and the potential is so great. Now, let's get busy and see it grow. Well, why can't you do that for the old man? Why don't you take my challenge and say, let's get busy and fill it up again? Everybody, if everybody talk it, everybody get excited about it, everybody don't act a fool, just get out there and, and live for God. You'd see this church grow again. You'd see it do greater things than it's ever done. I'm telling you, there's potential is right here. We've got what we need. Some churches, I've heard pastors say, they've taken churches, they go in and they get their role. Off the computer, they get the role of the church, every name. And then they go through there, and all the ones that are inactive, they start one by one visiting those inactive people. And they try to get them to come back to church. Some come, some don't. But see, if we could, and then they challenge the church. Now let's go visit these people. Let's go talk to these people. Let's invite them back. And they do that, and the church grows. Why don't we do that right here now? Why don't you invite somebody? Why don't you call somebody? Why don't you get concerned and excited about getting somebody in church? Now, I'm not fussing. Honest to God, I'm not fussing. I'm just presenting something to you that I believe it'll help us all. We ought to be excited about it. You know that because he's exciting and exciting. So the duty bound heart says prepare for more. There's more to come. The church is going to do better and more. Thousands of Gentiles are hearing, and we have got to be ready to disciple them. No greater person in all the world to seek for than Saul. He finds him in verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Now these men could teach these new converts, a lot of stuff. They could teach them about Calvary's cross, about the meaning of the cross, and boy, what it meant for Jesus to have to go to that awful cross. They could teach them about the church and who established it, who started the church, who it belongs to, who's the head of the church. They could teach them all this. They could teach them about the coming of the Lord someday. He's coming back. They could teach them the whole counsel of God. Paul said, I shun not to preach the whole counsel of God. So it is a great thing to be saved. But we need to desire to grow in the milk of the Word. Grow in grace and knowledge. Now, we have an orderly dedication here in verse 26. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, Barnabas and Saul did their duty in a very orderly fashion. Christian was first a nickname, and some called it that in a derogatory way. But in reality, it means Christ-like. In uh, 1 Peter 4, 16, the Bible says, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this behalf. Now, how do we actually cleave to the Lord? Jesus said, if we would abide in him and he in us, then we would bear fruit. The way to do it is prayer. 
Prayer is how we abide, how we cleave to the Lord. In Philippians 4, 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We cannot fathom the greatness of prayer or the power of prayer. Nobody can. Nobody. I've talked to many people about prayer. I've read books on prayer. Nobody fully understands prayer. I say that often, but it's true, but it's powerful. Prayer does a lot that we'll never see here. We'll see it in eternity. But we need to pray. All men need to pray. And all Christians find themselves praying. If you're a Christian, you can't help but pray. I mean, I just can't help it. Sometimes I get disgusted. I say, well, I, what's the use? I just give up. I'm not going to pray. You know, if the Lord wants to do it, I, he can do it. If he doesn't, you know, I get that old attitude. Huh. Five minutes later, I'm saying, Lord, would you help? Uh-oh, I'm praying. I can't help but pray because that's my life. That's what we do as Christian people. And then not only prayer we cleave to him, but learning. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now we sit at his feet, <coughs> excuse me, to hear the words of Jesus Christ and his wisdom. Mary of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, she chose that, to sit at his feet and learn. The delivered demoniac, hey, when he got delivered by the power of Jesus, he wanted to sit and listen to Jesus speak. He chose that. You and I need to sit sometime and read the Word of God and listen to him speak to our heart. And then uh, responding. Not only prayer and learning, but responding. In John 14, 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. I will love him and will manifest myself to him. What about that? Keep his commandments? He said, I'm going to love you. I'm going to really love you. I'm going to show you my love. Loving and obeying the words of Jesus draws us into a close and a wonderful fellowship, a great fellowship. We do sense his presence as children of God, and it's real. Now, they can judge us. They can call us crazy, fanatical, whatever. I wouldn't trade this church for the finest cathedral in Greenville. I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade the joy that we have here for all the stiffness and the coldness of these ice boxes without being just critical. I wouldn't trade this for any of them. I want to come to church. When I come to church, I want to have church, praise God. I want to worship Jesus. I want to praise Him somehow. I want to glorify Him. I don't ever get tired of thanking Him for saving this old sinner. Praise God, I would be in hell tonight if it had not been for him. And then, of course, separation. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. We've got to separate ourselves from this compromising, scallywagging people that we got in our world today, even in the ministry. you got people that are on TV right now that absolutely make me sick. I mean sick. They don't know God. They're up there just using the name of Jesus in mockery. And then surrender. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to the world. While we live here in these bodies, we must really yield to the Lord Jesus Christ because we're no good. There's nothing good about us. So we've got to yield ourselves to Him and mortify the deeds of the flesh. And then, lastly, well, we got to have faith. Got to have faith right here in Galatians 2, 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then waiting in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, and to wait for his Son, to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Cleave to the Lord. Cleave to the Lord in prayer, in learning, in responding, in surrendering, in separation, in faith, and in waiting for his coming. Now that doesn't make, that, that makes a lot of sense. That doesn't make you mad, does it? Huh? That ought to make you glad. 
that you have the opportunity, the wonderful opportunity to praise the Lord tonight. Now, there will be people that will do like those people at Jerusalem. They, they had their ideas about what was going on at Antioch and those places, and they sent Barnabas, check it out, make sure, you know, things are going right. That was the mother church that was concerned. Well, it's all right for the mother churches and the older churches to be concerned about us, but there's no other church has any business telling us what to do. We're independent. We're independent. We're fundamental. We're Bible-believing all the way. Being independent means we're independent. And we do what we do here because that's what God leads us to do. And we are following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If I had listened to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that came along in this church, I would have gone crazy. I'm almost anyway, but I would have gone completely crazy. One uh, person that joined this church some time ago, and every time I met this person, she would have something written out for me, some suggestions. So one day I told her, I said, ma'am, I don't want any more suggestions. Just keep them to yourself. I can't handle all these. My file's getting full, and I'm going to throw that file away and put it in file 13. I don't need your suggestions. So just don't give me any more. And brother, she quit. But I'm going to tell you something. I mean, I've got enough to think about without trying to think about every Tom, Dick, and Harry and what they think. You know what? I made a foolish mistake years ago. I had a suggestion box. Wow. Man alive, I didn't know I was so hated. No, but look. I mean, there's no sense in that. I'm pastor of this church. I'm going to read the book. When God gives me something to preach, I'm just going to preach it. And I don't need somebody to tell me how to do it. Oh, you should have said this. I know there are a lot of things that when I get through preaching, I think when I sit down, oh, I should have said that. I should have, but I don't need you to remind me of that. I need him to remind me of that. Let God tell me what to preach. That's the way it ought to be. And that's what the book teaches too, by the way. So let's just get in it, folk. And don't be ashamed of rejoicing in the Lord. Don't let criticism drag you down, tear you down, make you ashamed of your church. I mean, you don't want no bunch of fools acting fools. We don't want that. And we're not going to have that. But look, and somebody might get a little excited sometime and act a little bit foolish. One man visiting one time, you remember, ran around here and came down through there and got too fast. That's pretty steep grade right there. And when he made that curve there, he stumbled and fell and bloodied his nose on the carpet. Well, he wrote me, a, he's a good guy. He wrote me a letter and apologized for getting in the flesh. And I wrote him back and I said, I don't think he was in the flesh. I think he was in the spirit and the devil didn't like it. He put his foot out and tripped you. I like that. Because I didn't want him to quit shouting and I didn't want him to quit running. If you want to run, run. Hey, if something happens that's out of the ordinary, we'll get used to it. We don't have to say, oh me, it was all in the flesh. All in the, all in the flesh, it was not all. Of course, an old Marty Few said, somebody said, you were in the flesh. He said, I had to be. If I'd have been in the spirit, you couldn't have seen me. <laughs> so we are in the flesh, but we are let, we're responding to the spirit. We're letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide and direct and what our church is doing, I believe is right. I believe it is. Let's stand up for a minute. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, for this good night. Lord, for the people that have come out tonight to worship thee in spirit and in truth. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless every person that's here tonight. Bring us back this coming Lord's Day. Let us have a wonderful Lord's Day. Father's Day coming up. Bless the fathers. Lead God and direct our church, Lord. Let it always be a place where people are getting something done for God. Let somebody get saved all along. And I pray that Christians will get excited and that they will praise the Lord for what God's done for us because you've done much for us, Lord. We thank you for the good rain shower last night. We thank you, Lord God, for the food on our table. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for the clothes on our back. Father, for the roof over us to keep us safe at night, the house to live in, everything. We give your name all the praise, honor, and glory, but most of all, for Jesus our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.